Uh, our next guest on the program is, I've been looking forward to speaking and visiting with Jerry Johnson for quite a while. He's the founder and president of NiceInCouncil.com and the Apologetics Group. Um, his uh, bona fides are that he has a Master of Arts in Christian Studies, Master of Philosophy in Theology and Apologetics from Whitfield Theological Seminary. He is um, also a senior writer and researcher for the best-selling documentary Amazing Grace, The History and Theology of Calvinism. And if you've listened to this program at all, you know that we loved uh, that video and we talked about it to a great extent. He's a member of the Board of Regents for Whitfield Seminary, serves as an adjunct professor at Knox Theological Seminary and Veritas Seminary. And I knew one, there's one reason that I really wanted to talk to this man because he has been the chaplain since 2005, Jerry, uh, serving the Seattle Mariners minor league team, the Pulaski Mariners. And the Mariners are my favorite Major League Baseball team. And we welcome to the Mike Corley program, Jerry Johnson. Brother, thank you so much for being with us on the program today. Brother Mike, uh, it's a joy to be here. Well, let's get right into it. Uh, you have uh, the, the NiceInCouncil.com, the apologetics group, has come out, has produced this video. And the title of it is, Beware of False Prophets, the Case Against Charles G. Finney. And uh, Dr. Richard Belcher is... Uh, Quoted here on the front of the video, Charles Finney's false theology and gospel still haunt the churches of our day. Many are not even aware of it. Uh, on the jacket of the video, it says, For years, Finney has gotten a, uh, been uh, given a free ride from evangelical preachers and churches for various reasons, but mostly because few has ever taken the time to read his um, books, his obtuse books, or even try to understand his theology. Many supposedly came to Christ under him, and that was enough to convince multitudes that he must have been sound and biblical we'll tell people how to get this video here in just a bit but let's begin first of all with a broad question who was charles grandison finney well mike let me do say this one of the reasons i started researching this and like you you had mentioned some men that you have already interviewed on the subject dr michael scott horton um i know was one and of course dr john MacArthur has done some uh minor papers that mm -hmm. were addendums to the back of his books. I'm thinking specifically, if I recall correctly, his book, Ashamed of the Gospel. You're right. Um, but it may not be that one. It may have been another one. And I always knew that there were problems with Finney. Um, but it was taking a course. I'm working on my doctorate through Knox Theological Seminary. And about two years ago, um, we had an adjunct professor come in who did a whole class on Finney's theology. And, of course, that uh, professor was Dr. Richard Belcher, mm -hmm. who became a fast friend of mine and a mentor, and I just love him greatly. And uh, as we sat there in that class, because he loaded us up with reading material, we had to actually go in and read Finney's writings. And the more you read, the more alarmed you became. Now, who was Charles Finney? Um, Finney was for all intents and purposes, a uh, self-trained lawyer. Now, I don't say that disparagingly, right. because many attorneys back in the 19th century actually didn't go to law school. They were apprentices. Right. And I don't believe that they do apprenticeship uh, that often anymore. But Finney moved from law, according to his own testimony, to evangelist because he claimed to have had a conversion experience. And Finney became the lead person in what has historically become known as the Second Great Awakening. Right. Now, please understand, I doubt that it was an awakening at all. That's not to say that people did not come to a saving knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. I believe some did. But I believe the gospel that Finney was promoting was not the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, Brother Mike, if you'll give me a second, I want sure, to explain right ahead, what I please. mean by that. I had a friend years ago who was a Jehovah's Witness, and he was at a Watchtower weekend. It was like a, a Bible conference or mm -hmm. a seminar, and there were some people out in front of the place they had rented. It was actually a, a large auditorium, and they had a sign, read the Bible, not the Watchtower. Now, my friend David told me he and his wife were very offended when they saw that sign, because to them, they equated the Bible with the Watchtower publications. Well, he and his wife went home and decided that they were going to put aside 
all of the Watchtower publications and just read the Bible. And they were going to do that for one month. And they did, and consequently, uh, consequently, I don't even know if I'm saying that right. See how late Close it is enough. In the afternoon. <laughs> anyway, as a result, <laughs> they ended up coming to a saving knowledge of the Lord Jesus. Now, people would say, that's great, praise the Lord. But what you need to realize is the Bible they were reading was the New World Translation. Right. The Jehovah's Witness Bible. So, the Jehovah's Witness Bible, which is a perversion of God's Word, but there's enough of the Gospel in there that without the Watchtower governing body's commentary, the Gospel still got through to David and his wife. Now, would I, since this happened to David, encourage people as a form of evangelism to hand out the Watchtower Bible and Tract Society's translation of the Bible, known as the New World Translation? Mm -hmm. No, I would not. But God used it to reach David and his wife. I believe in much the same way God often can use someone, mm-hmm. be it a false prophet, a false teacher, um, even somebody mocking Christianity, to prick the hearts of one of his elect. I agree. And I think that's what happened with Finney. A lot of people did come to a saving knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. But yet, at the same time, if we follow Finney's gospel, we have to question whether or not the man himself knew the gospel. Correct, and we're going, to, we're going to get into some distinctives about his theology here in a minute, but a lot of folks may not know the history and, and the background of Finney. He was uh, actually professed to be Presbyterian, correct? Correct. He, he actually uh, attended a Presbyterian church prior to his conversion. Now, that was according to his own testimony. Mm-hmm. He was even the choir director of the church, pastored by George Washington Gale. And it was in New York. And Finney claimed later to have come to Christ, even though he was a member. And he was eventually uh, ordained in the Presbyterian Church USA. Do you think that he got his, he was ordained, did he make up what he felt he believed at that time, as some have said? I don't even know if Finney was sure what he believed. I like John MacArthur's statement that Finney... His theology and his understanding of Scripture was really derived more from his legal studies and not from the study of the Bible. Uh, His views of forgiveness, justification, sanctification, uh, original sin, total depravity, all of these theological terms that had meaning were redefined by Finney's legal training. And, you know, he approached the Presbyterian Church because he was out conducting revivals uh, even before he was ordained. And he was, uh, he approached the Presbyterian Church since he went there uh, to a Presbyterian Church and was ordained through them. And I think the record bears out, and again, this is in his own words. If you actually look up his own testimony before uh, Presbytery, when they asked him uh, if he held to the statement of faith of the Westminster Confession. Mm -hmm. Um, He basically lied to Presbytery and said, and let me quote, because he writes this in his memoirs when they asked him to affirm the doctrinal statement of the Westminster Confession. He said this, quote, unexpectedly to myself, they asked me if I had received the Confession of Faith. I had not examined it. That is the larger work containing the catechisms and Presbyterian Confession. This had made no part of my study. I replied that I received it for substance of doctrine so far as I understood it, but I spoke in a way that plainly implied, I think, that I did not pretend to know much about it. And this this is blatant deceitfulness. Right, and he went on he to say that... He deceived the men of Presbytery. Didn't he go on to say that he was uh, ashamed of it, of the Westminster Confession? Three, three years later, or some time later, I forget the actual uh, time frame, when he actually went back and read it, um, he actually said that if he had known what it said, he would have never even made yeah. this statement. Well, the video entitled Beware of False Prophets, a Case Against Charles Finney is produced by, um, is a production of the NicenCouncil.com, NicenCouncil.com, for those of you that don't know how to spell that, N-I-C-E-N-E Council, all one word, NicenCouncil.com. Jerry Johnson is the founder and president of Nicene Council and the Apologetics Group. Uh, Jerry, how can folks get this video into their hands? 
Well, um, simply they can either order it off of our website. You already gave the address. Uh, it's sixteen ninety five, and uh, or they can go to Amazon and order it there. Uh, some other uh, outlets carry it currently. Um, my good buddy John Hendricks at Monarchism Books. Um, I'm trying to think of some other ones, and I'm having a senior moment right now, Brother Mike. That's but. okay. We'll share them together. <laughs> um, glowing reviews and comments on this video, from uh, including our good friend Dr. Tom Askell and others. It's entitled Beware of False Prophets. We have done programs, as I mentioned in the beginning of this last segment, on uh, the work of Charles Finney. Uh, Jerry, how did Finney become so popular in the early 1800s? Well, I, I believe that Finney appealed, and I, I really believe that Finney, more than anybody else, and, and this, this could take a while to answer, but I will try to give you a Reader's Digest version. Okay. Um, Francis Schaeffer, in his uh, video series and book, How Should We Then Live?, discusses the failure of rationalism, what he calls the age of reason, mm -hmm. and that there was a paradigm shift by the philosophers in the non-reason. Now, this, this non-reason, I haven't been able to really trace if it was picked up by the Church first, which led to basic secular philosophy adopting it, or if it was uh, the opposite. But either way, by the time we hit really the late part of the 18th century into the 19th century, we see that the idea of Christian intellectualism started falling on hard times. Mm -hmm. And the idea that the Bible has the answer, that we embrace and believe in propositional truth, gave way to emotionalism and experientialism. Right. And we see this more with Finney. He was heavy on experience. Exactly. And as a result, I really believe that the Church has shifted, even today, as a result of Finney and others, into what I call anti-intellectualism. I agree. Uh, they went from reason to non-reason to uh, basically anti-intellectualism. They hate the concept of the intellect, and this is part of Finney's legacy. And so what, what happens is, when you appeal to people's base emotions, you have a tendency to do what the Apostle Paul said, you tickle their ears. Right. And when you tickle their ears, um, you can get a large following. People love to be told that I'm okay, you're okay. That's it. People love to be told that everything's just fine. Um, now, I'm not implying that's what Finney did. I'm just saying that's where we are today with uh, uh, Michael Scott Horton's book, Christless Christianity. Correct. I think it really hits the nail on the head with that. Let's talk about some of the distinctives of, of Finney's theology, basically three really uh, important points in his views on, for example, justification by faith. What did he believe in that area, on that doctrine? Well, his, his view, he would, see, he would employ the terms justification by faith. Right. But if I can, I want to step back real quick. Sure. Because the doctrine of justification by faith, of course, is really dependent upon your understanding of original sin. Now, right, original that's, sin that's is good basically point. Start there. that yeah is basically the first sin of Adam mm -hmm. is transmitted or imputed to all of Adam's descendants, and so we stand before God guilty for the the transgression of Adam's first sin. It's what we call federalism that that uh, Adam represented or was the federal headship representative mm -hmm. of all of the human race, and when Adam sinned. We all fell in him. And, of course, this is quite clear from Romans chapter 5. Finney denied this. Uh, Finney did not believe that our sins were, or Adam's sin was imputed to us. He was a Pelagian, meaning that he believed that man did not sin, or that sin was inevitable because man was born a sinner. He believed that man became a sinner when he committed his first actual sin. Now, this is heresy according to the scriptures, Absolutely. and according to at least seven church councils that I can name off of the top of my head. They condemn this, including the Ecumenical Council of Ephesus in 431 AD. So you're saying so that Finney... Finney a, you're saying that... I'm sorry to step on your toes. You're saying that Finney basically believed that sin uh, was not uh, by man's nature, but it was by the choice that man made, that he, he is, his sin resulted from bad decisions or wrong choices, Correct. Correct. It, it was it was it was rank free will, 
Now, it could be conditioned by uh, environmental factors, say your upbringing or mm-hmm. something like that, but it was still your sovereign choice whether to sin or not. And, of course, the question always comes up, could somebody theoretically not sin? The answer, of course, in that viewpoint would have to be yes, although I don't think any Pelagian ever maintained that was necessarily possible or that it actually had happened. So Finney denies this idea of original sin, and I quote in um, the Beware of False Prophets, even the Arminian evangelist, uh, Charles Wesley, I'm sorry, John Wesley, Thomas. says if you deny original sin, you're still a heathen, an unbeliever. Mm. That's, that's and, and it's quite ironic, just for a side note, you know, Finney despised the Methodist. Yeah. That, 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 that's a powerful point in and of itself. But he, he, he despised the Baptist with every fiber of his being. But so, he despised the Methodist also. So Finney denied the doctrine of original sin, and then that takes us or, or moves us also into his views on substitutionary atonement, and as I said earlier, Correct. justification by faith. Correct, because in denying original sin, of course, there is no depravity. Um, depravity is simply, simply uh, cultural and environmental. Mm-hmm. So if you choose to sin, then you're going to have to make the choice to stop sinning. And this really goes to Finney's view of justification, which he believed was really contingent upon full obedience to the law. And he said without full and complete obedience, there is no salvation. Uh, Finney mocked, and I mean mocked, the biblical and reformed doctrine of justification by grace alone through faith alone. He sure did. And I mean... When, when people actually will go and read his comments, and you can find them, here's, here's a, a, uh, uh, a quote from his uh, uh, Lectures on Systematic Theology, 1851 edition, page 747. He, he's basically saying justification is not founded in Christ literally suffering the exact penalty mm. of the law for them, and in this sense, literally purchasing their justification and eternal salvation. Wow. So it's not found on Christ's suffering. It's not found, in fact, he goes on to say, um, on page 735 through 737, we shall see that perseverance in obedience to the end of life is also a condition of justification. Mm. Some theologians have made justification a condition of sanctification instead of making sanctification a condition of justification. What he's saying is, you have to be fully sanctified before you can be justified, and the only way to be fully sanctified is complete obedience to God's law. Wow. Jerry, we need to take now, another... Christian... I'm sorry, oh, we need to ahead. take another break real quick. Jerry Johnson is our guest uh, from the NicingCouncil.com, NicingCouncil.com. Get this video entitled, Beware of False Prophets, a case against Charles G. Finney. And when we come back, I'm going to ask Jerry, um, why are we having this discussion here uh, all of these years later? He, uh, Finney lived and worked in the early 1800s, and what role did his ministry play on contemporary evangelicalism today? We've been talking in today's program about the video, Beware of False Prophets, a case against Charles G. Finney. It is a tremendous, uh, impacting, uh, informative video, and I wish I could get it in the hands of everyone listening to this program today. We have done programs on Finney before, and uh, Jerry Johnson is our guest. He's the uh, president and founder of NicingCouncil.com, the apologetics group, and Jerry, you made the comment uh, in the last segment, uh, d- just coming right out and describing uh, Finney as a Pelagian. And, and we were talking about the distinctives of uh, Finney's uh, theology, dealing with original sin, substitutionary atonement, and justification by faith. And you have described this man, and I agree, uh, as he was a heretic. But this is the same person that Jerry Falwell, the late Jerry Falwell, said was one of his heroes, and heroes to many evangelicals. Yeah, and I'm, I'm astounded. And, and in the video, I, I basically wonder whether or not they really paid attention to what Finney was saying. Mm-hmm. I mean, in all honesty, Mike, even when I was in Dr. Belcher's class, we read large segments of his lectures in systematic theology. But I would rather give birth 
than have to wade through that because it is literally chloroform in print. Mm-hmm. And I mean, he says nothing. This man pontificates and philosophizes with uh, page after page without ever really making uh, a coherent point. And uh, I, I, I consider his lectures in systematic theology, I actually call it an anthropology. It's not systematic theology, because it's all about man. And Jerry Falwell, J.I. Packer, um, I'm trying to think of Billy some Graham? others that we actually quoted. Who? Billy Graham um, was a uh, herald. Yeah, Billy King. Graham. Yeah, they all sat there and just praised the man. And again, I think... That this is part of what Dr. MacArthur was talking, the evangelical pragmatism. Mm -hmm. We have a tendency to look at what works, and therefore, it must be of God. I had an elder at a church one time tell me that God must be blessing his church, and I said, well, how do you know? And he says, well, look at all the members that we're getting. Look at all the money that's coming in. And I said, Brother Jim, on that basis, you could say that God was blessing Hugh Hefner. That's right. That's good what you got to ask the question is, are you caring for widows and orphans? Is the gospel going forth? Not how many people are attending your church, right. because that's not a standard. You err when you believe that gain is godliness. Well, here we are all of these years later, talking about the life and the, and, and, and the doctrine and the teachings of this man who lived and worked in the early 1800s. What impact has uh, Charles Finney had on... Christianity today, especially here in America? Okay. Well, let let me say this first. Why um, so many years later? Do let me say that the pastors and the Christian apologists of Finney's day failed to address the real issue. They really debated Finney on his methodology without realizing that his methodology was a result of of his theology. Mm -hmm. And I know that there were some great men that really stood up against Finney, Lehman Beecher, Azahel Nettleton, Mm -hmm. but these these men dropped the ball big time, and I believe that they would have responded to Finney biblically instead of pragmatism for pragmatism. uh, We may not have Finney's legacy with us today, but we do. And the reason being is because it seems to work. And I'll tell you this, Brother Mike, Joel Olstein, he is a spiritual descendant. I'm not saying in all points of doctrine, but this whole user-friendly God, uh, the whole idea of uh, we need to just get people in the doors, right. and uh, you know, th- this all comes from Finney's legacy. And uh, why, why do we have it today, or what is his impact today? It is that uh, we no longer believe that uh, justification is by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. Uh, we believe you can go to church and you're a Christian, um, and that's all that there is. Mm-hmm. Or the ABCs, you know, accept, believe, and confess. It's, it's not really pressing the true gospel on men's hearts. And that true gospel is, you're a sinner, you're born a sinner, even if you never committed a sin. Now this may upset some of your listeners, but even if you die in infancy, you are guilty of Adam's first sin. I agree. This whole idea that there's an age of accountability or that children who die in infancy automatically go to heaven, hey, I think it's a nice thought, but it's not biblical. It's not scriptural, no. It is not scriptural. Now, somebody will ask me, Brother Jerry, do you believe that all children who die in infancy are going to hell? You know what, guys? The Bible doesn't address it one way or the other. This much we know. Nobody is going to hell who doesn't deserve to be there. That's true. And nobody's going to be in heaven who deserves to be there. It's in the hands of a sovereign God. And everybody in hell is going to be justly condemned to hell. Jerry, let me ask you... No, let me ask you one more question. We're going to run out of time here in a few minutes. John MacArthur, and I'm not name-dropping here, John MacArthur told me one time that he was... um, um, at one, got to the point where he was shocked and saddened by the point uh, that he was going to spend, had to spend so much of his ministry proving the gospel to Christians. And, and a lot of the arguments or debates that I have with people now are not over uh, whether we sprinkle or immerse, it's over who we are. The, the doctrine of original sin, can I save myself? What role do I play? Are, are you shocked or surprised, not shocked or surprised, that here we are, 
all of these years later, and we are still having to drive home the points uh, that we are dead in our trespasses and sin and can't save ourselves? You know, it's, it's, it's astounding, but I'll never forget when I was uh, interviewing Dr. R.C. Sproul for Amazing Grace, the federal vision issue had just started to come to the fore. And it was myself and a couple of other men and one of my cameramen, and uh, one of them asked him about federal vision. Mm -hmm. And Dr. Sproul made this comment. He says, I shouldn't be amazed, and yet I continually am, mm -hmm. how often the doctrine of justification by grace alone through faith alone comes under attack. Wow. I agree. And I mean, that's, that's, where, that's where the arch enemy of our souls really focuses his attack on Scripture, on the not doctrine of God, and on the fall of man, and salvation by grace through faith. Because if he can overturn one of those, he can overturn them all. Amen. Jerry, before we leave here today, tell people how they can get a copy of this video, Beware False Prophets, The Case Against Charles Finney, and what else they can find if they go to your website. Well, they uh, let, let's start out with the latter. They can find over... I think right now, 900 different Christian documentaries, mm. some of them done by us, some of them done by, uh, or most of them done by others. We've done Amazing Grace, the History and Theology of Calvinism, the Marks of a Cult, the Biblical Analysis, the Late Great Planet Church, the Rise of Dispensationalism, and we're working on part two of that right now. And of course, Beware of False Prophets, the case against Charles G. Finney. They can go to NiceneCouncil.com or ApologeticsGroup.com or type in the Center for Reformed Theology and Apologetics into their search engine and go to the online store. They can also call us toll-free at 866-735-9582.